They do much better than my high school science teachers. <laughs> <laughs> I find a lot of times that the teachers don't know how it all is used themselves. And so therefore find it very, very difficult to practically illustrate what's being said. The thing we need to understand ourselves in this discussion is what I'm talking about are very basic forms of energy. In the future, we will find very much more significant forms of energy that have far less danger in their, in their use than the forms of energy we're currently using. But for the moment, a lot of our devices are, have these, are based on these forms of energy. So, so if we want these devices to continue working, we're going to have to produce energy that it is able to be converted into a form of energy that these devices can use. And you also need to understand then the devices and how they work, like in terms of their basic electrical properties. Now, one of the things I wanted to say at this point is that the modern day drawing of a circuit, an electrical circuit, has changed quite significantly over the last 100 years. So, any circuits that you see drawn by, for instance, Tesla in some of his diagrams, they are very different to what, how we would draw them today um, in terms of the types of symbols that we use. The main thing is to find the symbol that's interchangeable and just use that same symbol when you're drawing a circuit. Now remember, a circuit allows for the flow of energy. So a circuit could be just very simple. A cloud with a negative high voltage flowing and a high enough voltage to jump the gap, the circuit of the air, of the, of the atmosphere, and, and therefore to pull electrons from the earth to neutralise it. So that can be a circuit. Right? But in our practical ways, we want to contain the circuit. In other words, we don't want our energy flowing everywhere. We want it to flow in a certain direction to a certain devices. And to contain circuits, what we do is we create um, wires, if you like, that have a higher flow rate of electrons than the air around <coughs> about them. And then we insulate them from the air around about them. Mm -hmm. So when we construct a wire, there is a wire, and usually the wire is made of some kind of electric, electronic or electrical conduct, conducting material. And then we put a sheath around it, right? A sheath of insulating material so that the electrical power that we create only flows in the wire. It doesn't disperse to any other, to any other thing. Now, unfortunately, though, if you have a wire of a certain length, it has a certain level of resistance, just like a pipe does to the flow of water. And the resistance means that if you pass a current through it, it will eventually produce a voltage across it and potentially produce heat as well. So, so every wire has what is called loss, loss of energy. Now, obviously, the thicker the wire and the more conductive the wire, the less loss of energy it has. Yeah. But uh, it, we must remember that there is a loss of energy through different things. However, recently, um, in the last 20 years or so, mankind has discovered superconducting materials. And superconducting materials have a, thing, have a thing in them where if you lower their temperature to a certain point, they seem to go through a stage of transition where there's no more loss. Does that make sense? And, and so therefore there is zero resistance, no matter how thick the wire, to the flow of current. Does that make sense? And there are certain physical limitations on that, but, and, and those materials are called superconductors. Right? Superconductors in that they exhibit different characteristics of resistance than a normal wire would exhibit. Now, mankind has yet to discover many, many forms of 
Zero loss transmission. And yet God has created literally millions of types of forms of zero loss transmission of energy. God's own communication of love with you is a zero loss form of transmission of energy. So until it hits our resistance. Until it hits our resistance. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, God has created lots of different physical zero loss forms of transmission of energy as well. And we'll discover many of them in the team as we progress through the process of uh, allowing ourselves to understand things and open ourselves to experimentation. Okay, well, let's talk about the basic principles now of current voltage and resistance. Right? And then we'll get into what's called frequency and, and we'll talk about the types of current, alternating and direct current. So we have a battery, which is going like so, and we have a wire, which is connecting to, let's say it's connecting to a device, like a globe. You want to connect it just to a little globe. Let's say this is a 12 volt battery, like in your car, and it's connecting to a globe, which is your headlight. In the case of the car, you've got two of them. Right, so it's going to connect to two of them somehow. Now, if it connects to them like that, that's called it connecting to them in series. Right? But if it connects to them like this, then that's called connecting to them in parallel. Does that make sense? Very simple. Now, in most of these circuits, you will have a switch of some kind, because you don't want them on all the time. So in the case of your lights, your headlights, you only want to turn them on when it's night time. You don't want to run them during the day. The reason why you don't want to run them all the time, generally, is because every electronic device or electrical device does have a lifespan, and you want to reduce the lifespan. Uh, sorry, you want to increase the lifespan and reduce the amount of time that you're utilising it. Uh, yep. Does that make sense? So there's the headlights of their car. So you, you've got 12 volt battery uh, forming some, some electrical circuit with some wiring and then there's a switch that's switched on and all of a sudden the resistance, and this is like a resistor, but I've drawn it like that because it's actually a filament, which is a wound resistor, and and it produces, its whole intention is to produce heat of a certain type when 12 volts is put across it, put across the light. Yeah. Now, can you see that if I have a 48 volt light, then it's not going to be as bright because I've only got 12 volts going across it. So if the different voltages uh, allow for different currents to flow through them and so forth, and therefore th there is a rating on every device. So, every device generally is rated either by its voltage or its current, which is measured in amperes or A, the current. It's either measured by voltage, current or amperes. Uh, how do amperes? Uh, DRE. DRE. Or it's measured by a wattage which is generally, if, the, if, the, if it's just direct current, it's the voltage times by the amperes. Uh, or the current, the voltage times by the current. So every device that we use in any electrical system will have a rating of some kind. This is important to understand. The type of device will have ratings associated with the three basic things, voltage, amps, and resistance, generally, or it will have that and a combination of other ratings based on what type of alternative device it is. So, for example, a capacitor has capacitance, and so there will be a capacitance measurement. An inductor has inductance, and there will be a measurement of inductance. Every single device has a measurement of some kind, and usually a relationship between that measurement and the three basic measurements that you have in any electrical circuit, which is for current, voltage, and resistance. So the key is for us to understand current, voltage, and resistance. So 
So for example, these lights are really like resistors that light up. Right? That's all they are. So we could draw them as a resistor. Now a resistor, when we draw a resistor in modern circuitry, it's normally drawn like that. Now by the way, I was taught 20 years ago in electronics, so today I might be drawing even different, I'm not certain, but that's how we, you generally draw them. So they're like two resistors going across a battery, basically. Now of course when you close this circuit, there will be a flow of current. which will flow, because there's a voltage which is providing a potential difference across those devices, this resistor, and there'll be a flow of current. And there's a relationship between the flow of current and the voltage. And what I would like you to do for part of your homework is to find the relationship equation for voltage, current, and resistance. So how they relate to each other? How they relate to each other. Now, I've told you voltage is volts, I've told you current is amps, resistance is measured in ohms, which is a symbol like that. It's just a simple symbol designed to that we look at electronically and go, yeah, that's ohms, or that's resistance. It's the Greek letter omega. The Greek letter omega. Yep. So how is ohms spelt? O-H-M-S. What should people research in current sometimes might be I as well? Uh, yes, it can be, but usually A for ampers. I is usually another measurement called inductance. So it's best that we stick to what. So what, what I'd like you to do as part of your homework is I want to know the equations that describe the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Does that make sense? There's a lot of information on the internet about all this, and Wikipedia is a really good source of information if you want to find out these things. And, and in fact, every time we have a session like this, there will be some kind of homework involved in terms of finding out how do I find out about these particular things. So what I want to know basically is if I have a 12 volt source and these are 100 ohm resistors, how much current, how many amps are going to flow through that resistance? There must be an equation that can tell me that. Does that make sense? And we want to understand the equation. Can you ask the question again so I can write it down? So, so for example, if there, the, what I'm looking for is the relationship equations between voltage, amps, but current, voltage, current, and resistance. Yep. Does that make sense? Yeah. And if I put it in terms of practical sense. If I have a 12 volt battery like it's in my car mm -hmm. and I have a 100 ohm resistor like the globe of my you know, front headlight, mm -hmm. how much current in, turn, in amps will flow through that headlight? Now, why would I want to know such a thing? So you don't blow it up? Uh, that's one reason, although if it's rated at 12 volts it's probably not going to blow up. So you know how many volts to put through it so that it works? Um, no, because uh, rated at 12 volts, you already know that. Well, would you want to know if 12 volts would light it up, is what I'm saying? No, but if it's a 12 volt, if it's a 12 volt light globe, it will definitely light it up. Right. So we already know that. So why would I want to know? Don't find out the brightness of That's part of what we might want to find out. The uh, longevity of the battery. The longevity of the battery, yes. Because the battery can only supply a certain amount of current for a certain amount of time before it goes what you call flat. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's no good designing a circuit that only lasts for about 10 seconds and then everything's flat. 
Does that make sense to everyone? So we do need to know the relationship between these particular devices and what they do. Because then we can discuss what we need to do with the battery. So you know what your car does with the battery? Charges it. It charges it. Do you know how it charges it? Alternator. An alternator. And this is one of the things we'll describe with what's called alternating current. So when the motor of your car is turning around, it spins a motor, a little motor of its own, electrical motor, that's called an alternator, and the alternator is then what's called rectified and pumped the charge into the battery so that the battery recharges. If that didn't happen, your car wouldn't last very long on an average night. If that didn't happen. Because all the systems in your car are dependent upon the electrical charge. The very first vehicles that were ever, ever designed, there was no dependency upon electrical charge being supplied by a battery because they cranked the engine over and once the engine got turning, all of the devices started working. Right? But we are lazy and we don't like going out and cranking our engine, so we had to come up with an alternative way to start our engine, which is a motor, an electrical motor. And, uh, and that's called your starter motor in the car. And the starter motor draws energy from somewhere. So it can only store energy from a place that stores energy, your battery. So eventually if you turn over a car once and it starts and then you go and it's drawing energy but it's not recharging that energy, then you start it again, eventually your car, so you buy a car and it only lasts 500 starts. <laughs> and after that it'll be gone. Uh, obviously no good, so what they do is they create a system where they can store energy, produce, you know, produce energy for further, for further change. What we want to know is the relationship between these energy forms. Because then we can create circuits. So for example, if we put this, it'll scale this up to a bigger system, still assuming that it's direct current, because we haven't gone through alternating current yet, imagine that your whole house is really like a battery with a switch connected to a heap of devices which you could like and do one as one resistor. So all those hundreds of devices that are in your house could all be lumped together and if they're all turned on at the same time, right, we could liken them to a certain amount of resistance that uses a certain amount of energy. Does that make sense? So how do we calculate how much energy your house needs? Because if we're going to create a device that's a free energy device, we need to know how much energy your house needs all at once. Does that make sense? So we need to know how to create, how to calculate these forms of energy in terms of how much we're going to need to produce. So we do need to understand the underlying basic equations that allow us to calculate how much energy we need. So in the first question, you asked us um, how many amps would I need if I have a 12 volt battery and uh, something with 100, or how much current would, uh, how much current would I need, yeah. which would be measured in amps, measured for, in amps. for the light to function, and so my battery doesn't go dead. Well, the battery is going to go dead unless it's recharged. Yes. But, yeah. but we need to know how long we've got. How long? Going to yeah, and how much do I need? Yeah. But in this other equation, we would be asking ourselves, okay, this is this is the bulk of my household appliances. This is the top amount of current I know I need to. Uh, it's a different variable, isn't it? Now we're asking, what kind of voltage do I need? Uh, no, because right? all of the household devices all operate on a similar voltage. Um, or they convert from a similar voltage. Yeah, I mean, how big is my battery going to have to be? Is Basically, that right? yes. yes. That's what so. we own. If it's a battery, you see, at the yeah. moment, most of us are connected to the grid, so the grid becomes the battery. Yeah. yeah? But uh, if it's a battery, then yes, we need to know how big the batteries need to be. Oh, but but like in, in free energy, we don't want to store it in batteries. No. We want to collect it from the universe, but we need to know how much we're going to need to collect for the average house. And this is, sorry, that's my question. You're asking us to find an equation which relates voltage, current, and resistance. Yeah. And so I'm going to be working with a different variable in the second question as to the first question. Is that correct? 
What was the second question? Which is, if I have all my household appliances, what am I going to need to power this? Well, it's the same question, really, because there's a, no, it's just a equation about voltage, current, and resistance. Uh, voltage, current, and resistance. Yeah, it's the same equation. It's I understand. Right. Yeah, yeah, I can't ask you later. It's all right. Does that make sense? I'm just asking that question. All right. Now, now, of course, our house doesn't run generally. Most of your homes don't run on what's called direct current. Most of your homes run on what is called alternating current. Now, there are some devices in your home that run on direct current, but they convert the direct current from alternating current. Now, the reason why mankind's done that is alternating current is a lot easier to transmit over long distances than direct current. And I want to describe to you why alternating current is easier to transmit. Does that make sense? Alternating current is utilised in almost all devices that mankind has created in some manner. Right? And then we grab the alternating current and turn it into direct current. And there's some methods that we use to do that. But what we need to do is we need to understand why alternating current is the main reason, is the main thing that mankind has created over the last 100 years. Does that make sense? So let's firstly describe, so that everyone's alright with that question? Let's firstly now, let's now describe what alternating current is. Is that alright? Imagine if you had this same circuit with a resistor across it, like say, but instead of just having a battery which has a positive and a negative, alright, plates, in other words a direct, a, a single voltage potential difference, Imagine now you have a different device in there, which let's, let's call it a, just a device, whatever it is. I uh, don't know what it is at this point. That switches between positive and negative at each, on a rotational basis. So one moment it's like that, in terms of positive and negative, right? And then a little bit of time later, it's now like that, negative and positive. And then a little bit of time later, it switches between positive and negative again. It keeps on reversing its polarity, in other words. Now, reversing its polarity is a very simple thing to do from an electrical perspective because we need to, we create a device called a motor, and a motor or an alternator automatically produces positive and negative on a rotational basis. So as the motor rotates around 360 degrees, what it produces is a signal that looks like this, coming out of it. Where this is zero volts, and it goes to its full amount positively, and then it goes through zero again, and then to its full amount negatively. And then it goes through zero again, full amount positive again, and zero, full amount negative, and so on. So as this rotates, it's actually producing positive and then negative and then positive energy and any voltage in between. So if it's producing, if it, at its maximum it produces 240 volts, it will produce anything between 240 volts positive and 240 volts negative. So there'll be times when you measure it and it will actually be at zero volts. If you measured it at a certain point in time. But the period that it happens in, or the frequency that this occurs, it occurs at, in, in the case of your house, it occurs at 50 hertz, which is 50 cycles, complete cycles. One of those is one cycle, 50 cycles, per second. Hertz is cycles per second. Does everyone get that? So what we're doing is we're rotating a motor and we're rotating it so that every time it rotates it's one fiftieth of a second that it does a one complete rotation and therefore it does fifty of those in one second. Right? So the motor is rotating 
at a fast enough speed to do 50 rotations in a single second. And the output of that motor, or the output of that ordinator now, will be a, will be a wave of energy. So it's like a wave now. It's not just a direct single line of energy, but rather it's like a wave of energy. And a wave of energy that rotates between positive 240 volts in the case of your home and negative 240 volts. In the case of your car, it's about positive 17 or, or 18 volts for the alternator to negative 17 or 18 volts for your alternator. So, obviously, the generator needs to turn less in a car than it does in a house, so that it'd be less cycles per second in the example of the car as opposed to the house. Not necessarily. Um, in, a, in the generator of your, the alternator of your car, it has a variable speed, and the variable speed is taken from off of the flywheel, off of the um, um, fan, belt. fan belt of your car. So that's why you need a fan belt. The fan belt has, is a belt that, from the motor that drives the alternator. Mm -hmm. So because you rev up your car and then you drop down the revs of your car, the alternator spins at different speeds at different times. So in other words, it's a wave that has a variable, oh, okay. it has a variable frequency, whereas the power that's coming over our electrical system, that our lights are powered by and everything else is powered by, is a fixed frequency of 50 cycles per second. Does that make sense? Now you can have electrical waves, like in your radios, for example, you have electrical waves that are in the mega cycles per second, or kilocycles per second. In other words, thousands of cycles per second, or millions of cycles per second. So you know when you tune the FM radio, and we'll talk about FM maybe at some point in the future, because it's very different to what's called amplitude modulation. There's frequency modulation and amplitude modulation. We're getting to get more advanced things there. We need to know some basics first. But when you tune in your radio, the basic thing is you're tuning in your radio to a certain frequency, and that frequency, if it's in FM, many of you tune into like 109 megahertz, right, or 106 megahertz. The, that is a signal that is coming through the atmosphere that is 109 million <coughs> of those cycles happening every second. Does that make sense? Whereas your house, the signal coming to your house, which is also an electrical signal through, through the cables from the power company, is a signal that's only 50 cycles per second. Do you understand that? Yeah. Um, when you've got a, a device that doesn't fit your home voltage like a welder, mm -hmm. what's that mean? Um, a lot of welders need more voltage um, because they need to produce more current than what your average wiring of a home can produce. And so what they do is they use three phase alternating current to produce a higher voltage from the standard source. And that we're now starting to get into a bit more advanced techniques, but the reality is that a normal signal, you can imagine this, a normal signal is going to need two wires, and with a three phase, it actually has three phases, or three wires plus the earth. So, it, and it does that to multiply the voltage or increase the voltage and therefore increase the current capacity of the device. Yeah. So a welder that's rated at 415 volts is, uh, is needing three phase 240 volts and I'll talk about what phase means as well. Uh, do you want me to mention that now or is it fairly complicated? <laughs> Well, a phase is really another one of these signals operating over the same wire at the same time at a different phase, in a different delay from the other signal. A three phase has, two, has three of these signals, each of them 90, uh, sorry, 100, 120 degrees apart. So that just increases the ability to generate power, more power? It does. The reason why is if you draw one signal like that, and then you draw another signal, like 120 degrees, 
like that. And then you draw another signal 120 degrees from that, like that. You can see that at different points in time, these signals are going to add together. So there, even though those crossover points might be 0.7 lower, the reality is we've got two of them now at the same time, which makes this signal actually 0.7 higher than the original, than the crossover point. Right? So in other words, now this is at 1.4, the normal amplitude of what that signal would be. So you can actually multiply the signals together and get a bigger signal. And that's what three phase does. So that, sorry, so that relates to the output. This is related to the voltage and current curves yes, okay. of, of an of a alternating current source. Does that mean we can have four phase and five phase? Technically, yes. Direct, direct. You could have lots of different phases. Um, however, there are certain phases, if, at certain multiples, where they'll cancel out each other rather than adding to each other. And so you have to choose phases that would actually be adding to each other rather than cancelling out. Also, anything other than three phase is really pointless doing because you get large energy losses for little gain. But technically, you can have lots of different phases, yes. But in practice, three phase is about as far as most people would go because of the different energy losses of higher phases. You're putting a lot of energy in for only a little gain. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So. We have this generator, or in a car, it's called an alternator, that is now generating electricity. In the case of the generator that generates electricity for our houses, it's back at the power station, and it's cycling at 50 cycles per second. Why do they cycle it? Well, there's a very, very good reason why power is cycled. If you think about it, a direct <coughs> source, energy, so in other words a normal battery or something like that, like so, the current will flow, right, in fact it will flow, if you look at it from a purist perspective, it's going to flow from the negative to the positive because there are electrons that are flowing. The current will flow in a certain direction, but all of the current in the wire has to traverse that distance. In other words, one electron will push on the next electron and it will go in one direction only. And, and it's like, uh, what's the best way of putting it? It's, it's like the energy, I'm trying to compare it some, with something that we can understand easily. Um, Imagine it's like uh, getting a tube and having marbles and the, tube, the, the marbles are just a tiny bit bigger than the tube right? and you're poking the marbles down the tube. Does that make sense? And you want to get a marble out the other side. What's going to have to happen is you're going to have to poke all the marbles down for the length of the tube, aren't you? And then eventually the marbles will start dropping out the other side. Does that make sense? And, and, and now the, you'd have to feed them all in one direction and you'd have to push, keep pushing, pushing, pushing and the marbles keep dropping out the other side. Now, in terms of electrical principles, that creates a lot of force and therefore a lot of heat. Right? And therefore, if I want to transmit higher voltages through this pipe, so if you liken the current as being the marbles flowing through the pipe, and I want I want higher voltages across this pipe and higher amounts of current flowing through the pipe, then I'm going to get more heat. The more heat I get, the more loss I get. Does that make sense to everyone? Because the heat is actually losing energy. Anytime anything produces heat, you're losing energy. Yep. So the more heat I produce, the more energy I'm losing. Right? Now in a direct current circuit, and let, if the direct current circuit is a very close proximity circuit um, or has very, very thick wires, we don't lose very much energy. But if you start looking at transmitting energy over like hundreds of kilometres, potentially now you can lose huge amounts of energy 
through heat. Does that make sense to everyone? There is also another, for, another thing that happens when you transmit a direct current in that it, it, it forms what's called a magnetic induction around the conductor. So in other words, and we'll illustrate this through a few experiments next time we get together, you can pass energy down a wire and around the wire it will actually create a magnetic force or a magnetic field. But the magnetic field opposes the flow of the energy through the wire. Right? And so therefore it produces more heat and more loss. Right? So the problem with passing something down uh, a pipe that's in only in one direction is that you get a lot greater heat loss and you also get a lot greater electromagnetic induction generally through that particular wire at certain points in the wire and that creates even more heat and therefore the more potential you need much thicker conductors to transmit the same amount of energy so you need thicker wire now wire is expensive and they're always trying to reduce the cost of everything so they wanted to come up with a way that they could produce the same amount of energy down a wire that transmits for longer distances right without losing as much heat and without needing thicker wire and that's why alternating current and that's actually tesla that came up with alternating current it was never attributed to him but he was the original inventor of the principle of alternating current is that why when you want to have a switchboard down from a house, yeah. if it's a certain distance it won't work? Is that right? A certain um, distance from the house it won't, you can't get that? Oh, you mean an electronic, electrical switchboard? <clears throat> like if I, I was told, uh, I said, oh well can I have a cord from the house to this place in a certain distance? And I was told to be careful of the distance I want to run that cord to get my electricity. Is that yes, but it's not very critical um, in the case of a home. But there is a loss of the distance uh, and therefore heat generated over that distance. But it's not as critical as if it was direct current. Um, it would be very critical as to how long you put the voltage source away from where you want the power to be. In a, a alternating current, it's already transmitting like hundreds of kilometres. But usually there are voltage step down transformers. So you know how, you know, sometimes when you have a, 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 a thunderstorm and you have lightning strikes and they blow up a transformer, which is a, which is a device sitting on top generally of a, of a uh, electrical tower, or sometimes nowadays they have them on the ground. And, and those particular transformers step up or step down the voltage. So what they do is the inside, on one side they have a, filament like this using inductance that you put in 20,000 volts and then the other side you get 240 volts with a lot higher current right. and this thing here is called a transformer now the higher the voltage and lower the current the further the distance we can transmit the signal. The higher the voltage, the lower the current, the further the distance we can transmit. So if they tried to transmit 240 volts from the power station to your home, they wouldn't be able to do it over a period of 100 kilometres. Right? So what they do is they produce 20,000 volts alternating current coming out of the power station, or even much higher voltages, sometimes 100,000 volts. You know those big, what are called high tension wires you see sometimes across the road? They are very, very high voltage, three phase high voltage wires, parts with, with much lower currents. Right? And therefore they transmit much higher distances with lower loss, with lower heat loss and lower induction. And so what they do is they transmit that coming in, and then they have a device called a transformer, um, which you can actually make. Physically, many of you will maybe be making some of these devices at some point in the future, where you step down the voltage so you get 240 volts out with much higher current. Because there's a relationship between voltage and current, which you're going to discover. 
So, so what happens is that they transmit high voltage alternating current down the wire and then they convert it to a much lower voltage near your home. Right? And when it's near your home, it only can transmit a certain distance before it starts losing the voltage. And that's why they suggest that you put your box, your, your actual um, you know, power, power box that you have coming into your house, on your house. Is, is it because it uh, creates too much heat uh, well, when it's higher in your house. current? If you, you think about you, how your house is wired, yeah. basically this is how it's wired. You've got your power box, and then you've got a heap of what are called parallel circuits. Some of them are, some of them are circuits for lights, some of them are circuits for power devices, some of them are all different types of circuits, right? They all run on 240 volts alternating current, but there's literally, in, your, in a normal house, that often there's over a hundred of those parallel circuits or more, right? Now, if you add up all of those circuits, the, there's a potential of them all being on at the same time. So, if you look at the amount of current coming in through one wire, basically, has to feed the current going into hundreds of different potential wires. So obviously this one wire is going to be carrying more current, isn't it? For the current to disperse across lots of different wires, this one has to be carrying all of the current. Now obviously, because it's carrying all the current, there's a potential of it having a higher loss of energy. So you want to make that wire as short as possible. doesn't really matter so much how long these are, they're all parallel circuits that are all going to happen inside the house anyway, generally. But it does matter how short the one coming in is, because the longer it is, the more it's going to lose. The more power it's going to lose. Yeah. I don't quite get how you get such great voltage uh, with slower flow. Like you're saying that. Well, once you understand the question that I asked right at the beginning, oh, okay. and that's part of your investigation, I can't tell you too much more without, okay. you, <laughs> without giving it all away. Okay. I said that there is a relationship between voltage current and resistance. Yes. And once you understand that relationship, you can actually step up voltages as long as you lower the current. And you can step down voltages as long as you increase the current okay. from the same power source. So you can convert things. Right? And we need to know how to convert things because what we'll be doing is we'll be collecting cosmic energy, which is of a certain type of energy. We'll be turning that energy somehow into electrical energy of a certain type, probably direct current type of some kind. And then we have to somehow convert that DC into AC of a voltage that is 240 volts that runs our current devices. So can you see, we're going to have to understand the principles of how to collect this energy, how to convert this energy into DC, how to get the energy in to convert it into alternating current to run our home. Can you see? We're going to have to understand those principles before we can actually go ahead and do it all. Yeah. I think I might be asking the question that's relating to the homework, but um, AC is to volts. Uh, remember, this is measuring the type of current. So yeah. I could have 240 volts. DC means that it's only a single positive negative voltage source. In other words, it's only going to flow in one direction. Or I could have 240 volts AC, and that means it's going to be flowing positive and negative. There are different types of the flow of current that the voltage produces. Does that make sense? So whenever we say DC, we are always talking about direct current. In other words, the voltage source only has one polarity. When we're talking about AC, we're talking about a voltage source that switches its polarity faster, usually than 50 cycles every second. It's switching its polarity. Does that make sense? And the, volt, the AC voltage sources that we use in our home, switching of polarity every 50, sec, 50 times a second, 
In America, they have a 120 volt power source at 60 hertz. So that switches its polarity every 60 times a second. And it's only 120 volts in amplitude. Does that make sense? And different countries around the world use different systems. We're going to have to know how to, if we're going to make a proper cosmic energy generator that generates an energy, we're going to have to know how to convert that energy into every system on the planet. Does that make sense, everyone? Um, just with the frequency there, that's yep. frequency within a wire. That's right. And you can think of it as a wave travelling down the wire. Does that make sense? Imagine you put your hand in a pond. You can actually just move the hand up and down in the middle of the pond and the wave travels a long distance out to the edge of the pond, right? And this is the beauty of alternating energy too, is you only you have a certain amount of energy at its source and the wave itself can travel quite long distances. Right? But it's the going up and down of your hand that creates the wave. If you can think of it, this generator is like a thing electrically going up and down and creating a wave that comes out from it. Does that make sense? That then can be used, if we know how to use it, can be used to power things. So does that mean, like essentially, because the wire is the circuit which the frequency runs down, that um, for something like cosmic radiation, if you're looking for a frequency that's within the circuit of air? Yes, remember that a circuit can be closed even by air. And in fact, the circuit can be closed by gas, it can be closed by air, it can be closed by what uh, is called plasma, it can be closed by all sorts of other conducting materials, not just a wire, right? And in fact, a co collection of cosmic energy is going to be very dependent on our understanding that energy can be collected by, uh, through other, and, and transmitted through other means other than a wire. Yep. Um, is there, um the question about speed come anywhere in this? Like, it's at a constant? They're, they're all the same, the circuits and everything are all the same? No, they all came up with their own, every country of the world came up with a different thing for power. So it really is up to people developing a standard and then they decided, oh, we're all going to use this standard. So every device we make is going to be based on this standard and everything we use in the country is going to be based on this standard. So Hertz is actually the speed? Hertz is a cycles per second of the wave that is generated, and it's a speed. And like in the in the US, at 60 hertz, the the power is 60 hertz at 120 volts. Not. Does that mean that they get their power faster? No, it just means the wave the wave itself of energy cycles within a certain period of time at a faster speed. That's all. So so does that mean? You know, when you have a hairdryer and you take it to another country and you have to have a little plug thing. Is that a little mini transformer? Or no. Oh. A lot of your power devices are made inside of them so they can run on a voltage anywhere from 100 volts to 250 volts. So when you plug them in, if you plug it into a 100 volt, 120 volt source, it still runs. And they make the rectifier inside the power device to be able to handle any 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 frequency from 50 to 60 hertz. However, not all of your devices are like that, so you've got to read them. Uh, I, I had a friend come over from the States who stayed in my house and she brought a hairdryer with her. She plugged it into my house, turned it on, boom, everything went. And, uh, <laughs> and she wondered why, and it was because she was plugging a 120 volt device into a 240 volt system and her hairdryer was not multiple rated. So in other words, it, it, it blew up. So even the with the adapter, it melted. Yeah. Sorry. Even with the adapter, the adapter is not. The adapter is only a connection adapter. Yeah. Mm. There are some that have a transformer in them, and they are much more expensive, and they do convert voltage, right? But uh, the general ones that you buy for ten dollars or twenty dollars, they're not converting voltage. They're not a transformer. They're only a. They're only a pin transformer. They only. You know, so, so in Australia we have pins like that, right? In the US there's pins like that. Uh, in Britain there's pins like that. And so forth, right? So the different pins, uh, all of those devices do is put the power to the different pins. 
that's all they do. A transformer is a completely different device. It's a much more complicated device, and much more expensive to produce. And so therefore it costs a lot more. In Europe, it's 220, I think. 220 in Europe, yeah. Well, yeah. they made just a slight difference. That's right, yeah. yeah. It's, it's strange how every country decided that it's going to do something different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and there are certain limitations of lower voltages, and that is that they can't be transmitted as long a distance, right? So, um, so that's why Europe and Australia chose uh, higher, higher, particularly in Australia, higher distance transmission, so therefore higher voltage was needed, right? So, um, mm -hmm. but the reality is we could have all, in the whole world, standardised on one. Would have made life a lot simpler. Mm -hmm. so it's no less dangerous to go lower voltage. Like 110 in America? Or? Yeah, well, 110 volts is still going to kill you if the right cut. Yeah. So. But that's why the Americans chose the lower voltage because it's considered less dangerous. Considered less dangerous, but still people die from it. So. Um, my question's about the alternating between positive and negative. Yep. Is energy lost when you're switching polarity? Or does it, it does it maintain the energy source to push the current to go further? Yeah, the beauty, one of the things about what God's created through the universe with all different forms of energy is that waves always transmit longer distances than any uh, one single uh, action mm -hmm. can. So if you can go positive and negative on something, you will find it will transmit much further distances. And this applies to light, as well as applying to uh, electrical energy and other forms of energy. Right? So the beauty of a wave is that it has the ability to transmit very, very long distances. So there's one of God's laws involved in that. Yes, uh, uh, wave transmission. And there's a difference between wave transmission and observation. So, so at any one point on this wire, there will be a different voltage, won't there? If you could measure it fast enough, you would find if it's 50 cycles per second, if you measured at, at 500 times a second, there will be a period of, of, of a period of time where you measure no voltage at all on that wire. Right? And it's like a wave, a standing wave that goes through something. And, and the beauty of waves is that there's a lot of energy stored in them in comparison to pushing something in a, in a, in a single direction. Yeah. Like a tsunami. Sorry? Like a tsunami. Like a tsunami, yeah. A tsunami is a wave. It's an instant drop in, in the ocean floor. It drops a whole column of energy, might be you know, five kilometres deep, is dropped. Just only a few centimetres can be dropped. And yet that wave now is transmitted through water, and because water is very dense, you get this wave flowing very, very rapidly through the entire system. And then, of course, once the, pure, the, the shelf increases, then, of course, the wave and its power increases. But the energy began with that initial release of energy, and the wave transmits that energy. The actual water itself doesn't move at all. So um, in the case of the DC current, the actual electrons, the theory is that the actual electrons move. So if you think of direct current, so we have a battery through a resistor, the electrons actually are moving from the negative to the positive, right? And they are actually moving through every device in there. Right? But if you put a positive and negative energy in there of a certain cycle, the electrons are only moving back and forward in a certain distance. They're going back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward. They're not actually moving all the way down the wire. You understand? They're just going back, forward, back, forward, back, forward in a certain spot. Because at one moment they're going in that direction, next moment they're in that direction, next moment they're in that direction, and they're just going back and forward like that. And yet it's transmitting energy. It's just a wave transmitting energy. Does that make sense? Yes. Pretty cool wave, really. Yeah. And it's a pretty basic principle of transmission of energy, but it took us until 100 years ago to discover it on the planet. The back and forward motion that you just illustrated, is the transmission of energy possible because they're hitting one another or be create, because they're creating space between one another? 
Yeah, come up here and stand here next to me. <laughs> Right, now just just hold my I'll hold your shoulder like that. You hold mine like that, so you have got a hold, hold of me. All right. Now I go back and forward. You're you're going back and forward, right? Yeah. And imagine if someone was next to you, that'd be going back and forward too. So show mine that mile up here, right over here, that'd be going back and forward too. But none of us are actually moving very far. I'm only moving. I'm only moving this amount. And yet everybody would be moving around now. Can right. you see? Yeah, and so it's the, it's the impact. So I'm still energy. transmitting energy right down the end there, even though you and me are only just moving back and forward like this. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Does everyone get that? Mm -hmm. That's the beauty of alternating, alternating current. It's like a Mexican wave. It's like a Mexican wave. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> everyone stays in the same place, but but there is a movement of energy. So it's the electrons are present everywhere. Yep. It's just when they hit each other, then obviously, then obviously they affect each other. Affect each other yeah. But if you think of it, I'm going, I'm going back and forth. It's exactly the same. I'm going back and forth. Anybody around me is going to be, have to be going back and forth unless for us to be in synchronisation with each other. We're all going to have to go going back and forth together. Right at the end, you're going to get the effect of that energy. Even if that's a kilometre down the track, you'll still get the effect of that energy. Andrew? I've seen in Portugal that they've got... Now, cylinders sit on the ocean, on top of the surface of the ocean. Yep. And it's just basically the movement. The That's right. They movement. catch the movement of the wave and they turn that into the same energy. Any wave form of energy can be turned into any electrical energy. That's so cool. So, yeah, it's really cool. But potentially the ocean, like how much is the ocean used in electricity generation? Very little, but potentially it has the highest amount of energy. And, and, and no, in terms of um, yeah. Aside from cosmic radiation and other like, things. God's already created a system where a whole massive um, body yeah. moves and creates energy all yes. the time, every all day. Time, every day. Even the tide yeah. is, a, is a movement in energy yeah. created by the moon, the gravitational force. You can, measure, you can grab energy from any of these things. Wow. Yeah. As long as you know how to convert them. <laughs> That's the secret, yes? Is it? What they say when you're down near the beach or along the shoreline that that positive or neg negative eons is good for you? Is that that cosmic energy you're feeling? Uh, we're now talking about a completely different oh, thing. Oh, that's not the same thing. Yeah, not the same oh, thing. Okay. I'm just talking about the physical transmission of energy. Um, this is more a spiritual transmission of energy, which is oh. a totally different kettle of fish. But we need to understand the physical because the spiritual transmission forms of transmission, transmitting energy are built upon, or, or are very similar in nature to the physical forms. Oh, I thought it was because of the waves doing what they do, they're sending out energy. So well, there are, but there's, spirit, there's spiritual forms of energy that affect your spirit body, which is different to the forms of energy that affect your physical body. Okay. Yeah. That picture you've got there hurts, and you've got your wave from zero point volts to zero point volts sort of thing, and that yep. goes through a cycle. Yep. In DC, would that just go from straight line? But that's right. If you if you had it, if you drew that DC, um, in that same period of time, is a thing like that at say let's say this was plus 240, it would just be 240 there and a straight line. So like you're saying before, I say travel spur. If you stretched that wave out, that wave line would be a lot longer than the DC would travel. Uh, it's true, but but it's more the wave effect that causes the no loss of the transmission or far less loss of the transmission than it is the actual trans the, the energy flowing the entire distance. Right? The reality with this is the energy has to flow the entire distance in one direction. Therefore the electrons themselves are constantly moving, therefore constantly producing more heat. They're not going back and forth in a single location. Sort of like here with the hundred people down the line, you have to run all the way down the end to push the person rather than just do this. Yeah, well one is me going like this, here, and then the other, if we're all connected solidly together, then the person right down the end, sort of hundred metres down the end, would be going like this, right? Right? There might be some phase delay, in other words, there might be, you know, when I'm going like that, it sort of the wave goes along and then back. It depends on how fast I can do this as to how fast <laughs> I can do it down the other end. Right? So there's some physical limitations about how fast I can make that happen. But if I, if I compare it to di direct current, direct current is me standing here and pushing the whole hundred people. 
in one direction. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. To do that, I have to move. It's always all those people like the wire, basically, aren't they? Yes. Yeah. People connected together like the wire, and me going back and forward like this, the energy is still getting transmitted out the other end. But if I'm pushing, the energy is still getting transmitted out the other end, but I'm actually now having to move the entire distance. Whereas if I'm going back and forward like this, I'm just staying in the same spot pretty much. I don't have to move anywhere, so and energy is still transmitted. Does that become more econ economical use of the source of power then? Alternating current as opposed to direct? Certainly, certainly. Uh, alternating current as a source of power is far more economical than direct current as a source of power. That being said, direct current is uh, often what powers a lot of our devices, not all of them, but a lot of our home-based devices are powered by direct current. So we need a way to con convert between the two forms of current. Now, there is a device that converts between direct current and alternating current and alternating current and direct current. And they are called different things. I'll just use the new terminology so they understand. To convert between direct current and alternating current, that is often called an inverter. You heard of that term? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. To convert between alternating current and direct current, that is often called a rectifier. That makes sense? Good to work, is it? Yep. Okay. It's amazing how fast time is. Yes? Can I just ask, you talk about going back and forth and then pushing, but what does a domino, where does that come in? That's well, the domino is a bit like, the domino is falling one after the other, it's yeah. a bit like direct current. Yeah, but you're not moving, so you're just saying that. Uh, yeah, but, but, but you'd only, foot, when, when this one falls, the domino at the end would fall at the end, yeah. but to actually make the next domino fall, it's already fallen in the example you're given, so it's not a good analogy of current at all. Oh, okay. uh, so don't use dominoes as an analogy of current. Yeah. So there, would there be any momentum build up, like in direct current with electrons flying, or would it work on different principles? And there is momentum build up, but unfortunately there is also the anti-momentum of the, uh, the um, magnetic field that it creates. Right. So, so unfortunately um, there are greater heat losses as a result of the magnetic field. Uh, it's important to understand the relationship between electro electricity and magnetism, because if we can understand that relationship we can convert things very easily from one form of energy to another form of energy. And magnetism as a form of energy is far less dangerous uh, for the same types of energy than electrical energy is actually. AJ, with your example of tall buildings, yep. I've seen documentaries where they talk about the sway of the building mm -hmm. that actually generates electricity, and at certain levels of the building they're made to... That's correct. ...to do something. Anything that moves can potentially generate electricity if there's circuits attached to it in some way. And remember, the circuit doesn't have to be a physical circuit. Remember, air itself can be a closing of a circuit. So there's all sorts of things that can create energy. Um, it's just whether we can create them in a, with enough power to drive the things we've created, you know. And the problem is that most of these forms of energy don't generate enough power for us to utilise, readily utilise. However, things like waves, uh, things like hydroelectricity, obviously heat re re uh, reduction from a, a radioactive furnace and other things like that, they all produce forms of energy. And we can turn one energy form, so in other words, the expansion of a gas, uh, which is what boiling water is, turning into steam, the expansion of the gas, that energy can be turned into electrical impulse if we have a device that converts the energy. We, um, we went to a biochar workshop a couple of weeks ago, for Lean and self A what workshop? It was a, it was a biochar workshop. It was converting, instead of making pure charcoal, you actually make a charcoal that's a fertiliser. Yep. And they were using, um, it's a different heat dispensation method, so yep. they create a paralysis heat. Yep. And they also have a combustible, a combustion of the gases that are released. Yep. So all that could actually, all that heat that's generated at 300, 500 degrees Celsius, we could convert all that into electricity. Yes, on the planet today, 
there are literally millions of ways we are wasting energy. <laughs> literally. Like, and for example, the average garbage dump wastes huge amounts of energy. But it, there's huge amounts of methane uh, given off by the de decay of rubbish, for example. And, uh, and if we could tap that process, rather than misusing it, like we currently do, the decay of the rubbish would actually be creating our electrical energy for us. Right? And it can produce significant amounts of energy, the decay of rubbish. But, but we don't utilise it because man has... Look, to be frank with you, many of our systems on Earth are totally developed so that a few people can get rich. You know, that, that's the main reason. They're not developed being environmentally sensitive or taking care of our environment or having no waste or any of those things. They're developed primarily so that, so that people can measure the electricity and therefore charge it. If they can charge you, then they can earn money from it. If they can earn money from it, then they... And, and so what mankind has done, has, they have chosen the development of energy specifically so that it can be charged. And this was something Tesla was very upset about. Because he developed forms of transmission of energy that, that you could still transmit large amounts of energy to any place in the world, but it was very difficult to charge. It was very difficult to allocate. Wayne, you've bought 500 kilowatts this way. Right? There was no way to measure that. And so what, what they did was they threw away those projects because there was no way to charge it. it when you think it was ludicrous. Like, whole of mankind done a disservice so that a few people can make some money. Not really nice. Um, could they make uh, energy from sewage systems? Oh, very much so, that's what I'm saying. Every sewage system, I think myself and Cronie were talking the other day, was it 10 people's average output could produce enough gas to run three meals a day, for the gas three meals a day from the gas itself? Or point use electrical generation for six, for six hours. hours. Yeah. For enough for six hours for those people. So that's 10 people's bodily output. Yeah. We're just wasting energy everywhere. You know, that's the reality. Yeah. We only have chosen forms of energy that we can actually measure and bill. And in doing that, we have severely limited what we're cap capable of doing on the planet, even with our own technology, without introducing any new technology. In China, they use a lot of uh, human decay to heat themselves. Yes. And there is, a, I think, a French guy who is uh, selling a lot of little device to, to China, just yep. for the, this reason. Yep. Yeah. And they're realising in a lot of countries now that this whole idea of me you know, measuring power, while it benefits a few people, it does severely impact upon the growth of a country and other, and other factors. <clears throat> okay, well, so far we've basically gone through the principles of current, voltage and resistance, we talked a bit about the Earth, we've talked a bit about frequency, and we've talked about what direct current and a, uh, alternating current is. Right? So your homework was to find out the relationships, the mathematical relationships, between current, voltage and resistance. Right? They are very, very simple mathematical formulas. Very simple. Right? So the key is to find them. And then we'll do some calculations. But I thought the next time we get together, we want to discuss some of these things in more detail and have a few practical examples in front of you so you can see what actually happens. So, for example, when we pass, we want to see what happens when we pass an electrical current through a wire that is wound, for example. We want to see what happens. All right? Now, what I would suggest, if, if most of you want to find out more about this, there's a few basic things that you can do. And my suggestion is to buy just a couple of basic things. Some electrical wire, a, a 9 volt battery, you know one of those little 9 volt batteries? Yeah. 
little square ones. Yeah. We want uh, a nine volt light globe. And we want um, what is called, um, so there's electrical wire that is insulated with plastic type of insulation like you had in your car, you know, in the car wiring. But there's also some wire, just get some quite thin wire that is uh, on a spool that is very, it, that, it, that is uh, coated with insulation that you can strip off and solder. Um, because what we want to do is we want to show you some of the principles of electromagnetism through these processes. So it'll be wire. Um, now, what's the name of it, Graham, that wire? Is it, it's just called... Um, enamel wire. Not enamel wire, no, just a uh, wire that's covered with a resin, an insulating resin or something like that. You know, what you're using copper wire. For wiring coils. Is it? Yeah. Enamel wire. It's, it is called enamel. Enamel. Get a fairly thin gauge of it because a 9 volt battery is not going to produce very much current and we want to limit the amount of current because we want the battery to last a while. So you get a very thin gauge of the wire. A thin gauge means very thin wire. And we'll be able to wind, we're going to be able to wind it, and we're going to see the effects of electromagnetism as well in this process, right? We want to investigate the effects. Because uh, next time we get together, I would like to introduce you to a few more um, concepts. One is capacitance. One is called inductance. And then these... These will relate to the issue of what are called motors, generators, and alternators. Okay. You see, um, it's one thing to collect the energy and what we want to do is we do want to create some devices that collect energy, but we need to know how to get that energy into a form we can use. Does that make sense to everyone? Yep. So we need to understand the principles involved. We're getting the energy in the form we use. The beauty of just getting a few basic little devices initially to start with is that we, 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 we have no danger of harming ourselves with those particular devices to experiment a bit. When we start building these bigger devices, then there is a danger of harming ourselves. So we need to understand the principles involved before we start doing some, something that's bigger and more dangerous. You can often buy little uh, electrical experiments kits that will have all this sort of stuff in it. Yeah, I think, uh, wasn't there one at... Uh, yeah, Toy World's got Toy one. Toy World's got one. And there, there's all different types. As well, yeah. So they're about twenty-five bucks for a little. They would have all that sort of. If stuff. I was buying one, I'd buy one with at least those in it, and perhaps with a little tiny motor in it, and definitely with some capacitors and resistors and inductors in it. If if, if you can buy one, inductors we can make, capacitors we can also make. So where about if in Kingaroy would we find that? Well, in Toy World you could get a little. Is there a Toy World in Kingaroy? Yeah. Yeah. In Haley Street. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I think okay. Mm. Um, cool. yeah. That's a wiring. Dick Smith also sometimes has these little kits. And that, there's one of those in yeah, Kingaroy. They don't have any. They don't have they don't any. Have any. No, there's a J car that often have a little kit. There's J car is just by the ammunition shop in Kingaroy. Just around the corner. Yeah. The J car one. They don't have it. They've got they'll a little catalogue and they'll order it in for they'll you. They'll order it in for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. What do you feel about today? Is that the kind of stuff you wanted to, that you were expecting? Yeah. I really like it because it's just, um, I've sort of lived on standalone solar and the 
Sparky would come out and try and explain it to me and I could never get what he was talking about because I just realised that I was missing some really basic principles basic yeah. things, so I'm really grateful for all yeah. of that. Well, what we'll do in fact is we'll, you know, down the track we'll talk about solar systems and what their good points are and what their bad points are and so forth. We, in the end we want to produce energy systems that are far more uh, efficient with the utilisation of energy than a solar system is. We also want to produce systems that don't need the sun to work, right? So, because, of, you know, you want to be able to work them at night, obviously. Um, we also want to produce systems that don't use any toxic materials. So, so we, the problem with most batteries is that most batteries use toxic materials of some kind, you know? Nickel cadmium, for example, cadmium, very toxic material. The lead acid battery, acid and lead, both, but the lead is very toxic to the human body. Acid is also dangerous if it explodes or something like that. So these are toxic material devices, unfortunately, and we need to come up with alternative methods of either storing energy, and if, and if we have energy sources we don't need to store, that's the best. Because mm. then you can produce energy day or night in under any circumstances and conditions without having to have a storage device. Right? And that's going to be, you know, then we don't need batteries at all. Don't need batteries at all. And we could scale the system right down to a miniature type of device that powers like a little device like a recorder. And we could scale the system right up to something that, you know, you carry around a little suitcase that powers a house. Or you carry around in a suitcase that you put in your car and it powers the car or scale it up even further, something that powers immense factories and other things like that. Um, and all of them can be standalone, so there doesn't need to be unsightly wires being transmitted across long distances, there doesn't need to be radiation effects from those wiring. There's all sorts of advantages if we come up with these kind of devices. Right? So, so it's really important that we understand the basic principles, and then once we understand the basic principles, when we start experimenting, we can see what's causing different things. We can also, we also then know how to convert energy from one form of energy into another form of energy. And that's very important to understand. So later on, I'll be introducing, asking you to do some homework that's even more complicated formulas right? that enable you to, for instance, create your own motor or create your own transformer or, and so forth. Yeah of what kind of materials we would need to do such things. So any questions about where we're headed? Direction was? Yep. So can you see it's very important that we understand these basic principles before we can really build a device that we can utilise? Um, yeah. Well, after us change, maybe they won't be any more house device. Um, using this energy? Well, well um, um, I feel we will certainly have uh, devices that use the energy and, uh, and so therefore um, highly likely there will still be devices from old that we want to access. The reality is once your soul is in a specific condition, uh, myself and Connie were discussing this just early briefly in the toilet, and uh, once your soul is in a specific, specific condition you will not actually need to produce any energy outside of that. So you won't actually need any devices to do any job. But, but there, is a there is still a need to communicate to people who are in, not in that condition. So, so for example, um, if I can communicate telepathically with yourself, then why would I write anything down to you? Like I wouldn't use email, would I? I just go to the bank, bang, you've got it, no worries, and we're off we go. But if you can't receive my telepathic message, now we have an issue of communication. Does that make sense? We need to have a device that converts my telepathic message into email so that you can read. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. To enable people who are not in the same condition of development to still communicate. So I believe we are going to need devices that allow for the conversion of information and communication and energy 
from one form to another for some significant period of time until everybody on the planet can do the same thing. Does that make sense to everyone? If we're loving, that's what we would do. Is it possible that one half of the soul is positive and the other half of the soul is negative and that when they come together they create this... I know this is a different type of question. Yeah, and it's totally unrelated and no, it's not possible. It's not, it's not the way the soul joins or anything like that. The soul basis don't apply physical principles. There are principles in physics, in physical principles, that do apply to spiritual and soul-based principles in terms of an analogy, right? But, but they are very different systems in practice. So, for example, the fact that I am attracted to my soulmate or, or am attracted to any person who I want to then have a child with, there's a high likelihood that God then had children. Like, there's an analogy there that I can take, right? The fact that I... The fact that I have an attraction that creates a child means that God must have somehow created children in a similar manner through a sexual process. But it doesn't mean that God is two, a male and a female, getting together and having sex to produce us. Right? So you've got to be careful about taking every analogy too far. Okay. Thank you. Mate. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm not sure... We're not going to get together with the team next, but um, but I feel there is quite a lot of investigation that can be done in practice now. Like my suggestion is get together a little kit, start experimenting with some of these principles, and the next time I get together with the team, um, I'm not sure when that will be, but um, but it will probably be uh, next month, in mid next month probably. Um, and what I'd like to do there is go through these principles and then give you a series of experiments to try with your experiment kits. Does that make sense? In order to work on understanding the principles involved. Okay. okay. What uh, Justin does with the team in between then, I'm not sure. Right? So, but uh, you can also, also always find another another person in the room <laughs> that will come and teach you some principles. Good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.